I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. John O'Mara, Chief Scientist and Deputy Director at the WM Keck Observatory and Co-Chair for the Habitable Worlds Observatory START Team. John is an observational astrophysicist and cosmologist with a wealth of research and teaching experience, as well as public outreach and science advocacy at the local and federal level. He's a member of a number of astronomy and astrophysics advisory committees, and also the team leader lead of the Luvyar Large Mission Concept Study as a part of NASA's Cosmic Origins Program Analysis Group. John has a bachelor's in physics from the University of Washington and a PhD in astrophysics from UC San Diego. In addition to extensive career experience in academic research in education and organizations including NASA, the WM Keck Observatory, National Science Foundation, Vermont Academy of Scientists, St. Michael's College, Penn State University, and MIT. So John, welcome, sir. It is truly a pleasure and an honor to have you with me today. Really excited to be here, Tim. Thanks so much for the invite. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Well, so today we're talking about ideas and themes in optical SETI, astronomy, and the search for life in the Milky Way galaxy, which is one of my favorite topics. And you are in the envious position of being in the group that is designing <laughs> the upcoming telescope to do just that. So let me start right out by asking about NASA's Habitable Worlds Observatory, uh, what the current project status is, and how you were involved with it. Sure. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of a historical arc. So we, whenever we build a flagship class observatory, multi-billion dollar observatory in, in, at NASA, um, the, the process to get to that is, is a long and arduous one. There are these series of things called decadal surveys in which the astronomy community writ large comes together and says, these are our top science priorities, and here are the tools that we think we, we need to, to, to to build to get them and and that survey provides a prioritization for those facilities and those science topics and that survey was responsible for recommending things like the James Webb Space Telescope the Roman Space Telescope the Hubble Space Telescope Chandra all the ones that we know all the major space facilities and all the major ground based facilities for the US community were recommendations by the survey and the most recent survey which came out in 2021 um, which is called Astro 2020, but it came out in 2021, thank you, COVID, uh, recommended, amongst other things, the process, beginning the process to build the next great flagship observatory, which was then renamed the Habitable Worlds Observatory. And the mandate for this observatory was to go out and, and try to, to definitively sample exoplanets in the nearby regions near to us in the Milky Way and survey them for the, the fingerprints of life, for biosignatures in their atmospheres. And to do a large enough sample so that it has statistical meaning. Because if you look at two or three things and you get a null result, that means you looked at two or three things and got a null result. It doesn't tell you anything profound yet about the universe. But if you look at enough exoplanets and, and survey them to enough robustness, you can really start to learn something about whether or not life is abundant in the universe or very, very rare, if not unique here to Earth. But that's not the only thing the, the, the observatory is tasked to do. It's also tasked in many ways to be a super Hubble or, or, or a web-like telescope to, to do really transformative general astrophysics. If, if we think about, for example, the astrophysics that, that the Hubble Space Telescope is doing today, it's doing astrophysics that didn't even exist when Hubble was launched in 1990. And the reason why I can do that is because it's an extremely capable telescope across, you know, wavelength across, um, resolution across, all the things that the instruments have. And Habitable Worlds is in that same spirit. It's intended to be serviceable like Hubble was. It's intended to have a robust suite of instrumentation, not just uh, exoplanet instrumentation. And the major difference is that it's significantly larger than Hubble. It's going to cover roughly the same wavelengths, so it will do ultraviolet, which uh, is something that Webb currently doesn't. You know, we're, Webb does infrared primarily and, and, and out into the infrared. And this will be kind of like a super Hubble, but it will be a super Hubble that's able to do what no telescope in the history of, of humanity has been able to do, which is to have the both the precision and the stability to try to look for the fingerprints of, of life in, in the 
planets uh, in the atmospheres of, of planets not our own and not in our Milky Way. And just, just to give you a sense of how hard that is, um, I, I like to do a little thought experiment, which is, you know, when, when you look at two objects on the sky and they get farther and farther away, you know, they get closer and closer to each other on the sky. This is just a, a projection effect, parallax. And if you wanted to look at our solar system and you look at the Earth orbiting around the sun and you happened to be 30 light years away, the distance on the sky between the Earth and the sun is the distance, you know, is, is about the width of a human hair held at arm's length if your arms are two football fields long. That's how close they are together to each other on the sky. And that requires a telescope with uh, a big enough mirror to be able to do it and a stable enough system to be able to make that measurement. And it also has to turn the star off because we see planets in reflected light, and the star itself is about a billion to 10 billion times brighter than the planet. So somehow we have to come up with the trick of how to turn the starlight off. And that's, that's a trick called coronography. Um, Hubble has a coronagraph, and, and Webb has a coronagraph. But the coronagraphs on those systems are, are a factor of a million to a thousand um, to too incapable to do what we want to do, which is look at Earth-like planets around sun-like stars. So yeah. that's that's the grand vision for the observatory. And it's it will be the most powerful thing human beings have ever put in space to to look out on the universe. And it's it's a really exciting time. It is. It it is I this is something that I'm really excited about. The technology itself is absolutely amazing. And I think that you guys are benefiting from a convergence, right, in terms of manufacturing, decrease in launch costs, as well as just I mean, information technology and imaging is just mm -hmm. surging forward. You know, I, I do photography and I know in that field it just I mean, the commercial sector has just been surging forward. And then what you guys are looking at in terms of custom stuff is that much more, you know, amazing, right? But mm -hmm. Um, you know, I want to back up a little bit for the audience, though, because not mm -hmm. everybody is familiar with kind of the backstory here. So just recently, back in December, a NASA study funded by the Habitable Worlds program indicated that 17 exoplanets could have potentially oceans of liquid water, which makes them possible candidates for life. So this itself was a big announcement. And this was based on primarily like the Webb telescope, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there's there's been this has been in many ways, you know, to to use a tired phrase, the the holy grail of of exoplanet studies is to look for planets that have liquid water on their surface and a dense enough atmosphere to hold that water on the surface and perhaps harbor life. And so we've been marching towards the discovery of those types of planets. And largely we've been doing this statistically. We'll look at a thousand exoplanets and try to get their distance to their host star and use models to say what that means for the atmosphere. But now we've gotten really good with, with telescopes like Hubble and, and now especially Webb with doing this transit method where the planet goes in front of the star. And if you look at the difference in what the starlight looks like just the star and when the planet is in front and subtract the two, you get the fingerprint of the, of the planet's atmosphere. And in doing so, we've started to find planets which could have uh, liquid water on, on, their, on their surfaces. We've, we've found planets with, with atmospheres that have things that we're used to hearing about, you know, carbon dioxide and, and, and water vapor and things like that. And so that's that's giving us the telltale signs that we're not going to build the Habitable Worlds Observatory and have nothing to look at. It, it's giving us the sign that we're going to have a lot of things to look at. Now, it, it is in no way a guarantee that we actually will find living worlds out there. Yeah. But it is a good sign, A, that enough of the planets look at, are, are out there that are interesting to look at, and, and B, that we have the technology roadmap to build the observatory. So you spoke of a convergence in technology. We're also at a convergence in science because exoplanet studies have gotten robust enough to ask this question in a non-philosophical way, in a really scientifically robust way. And technology has matured enough that we can actually build the observatory, which we haven't been able to do. We now know the technological tall poles. We have a path to get over them. We know how to build this thing. We know what we want to build, roughly speaking. And... 
the process that I'm involved in now and that and that you've you've been looking into is the process of defining what are the science capabilities that we need, what are the technology capabilities that we need to mature, and then in later stages they'll actually pick what the observatory looks like. We're not doing that yet, but we we really know at least to to first order what we want to do, and now we're now we're getting our pencils out and doing the tough homework. Well, it, I, I mean, again, it, it's so remarkably exciting. And I'm jumping around in my questions a little bit, but like mm -hmm. one of the things that I'm the most excited about in this is obviously the search for life, right? And for me, this brings me back to the Drake equation. You know, people mm -hmm. in the audience have heard me gloss over about Drake a million times, but you know, the, I mean, one of the things that he had said was there were something like 10,000 advanced civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy. And my thought is that for each one of those civilizations, whether or not we ever hear from them, the Drake equation kind of implicitly assumes that there are thousands, potentially millions of Earth-like planets with life on them, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is hopefully directly imaging some of those planets. And even if it turns out they don't necessarily have life, it'll, it'll help us refine our estimates of how many Earth-like planets are out there, right? Oh, absolutely, and and um, I think the other the other fun axis to think about is not only are they Earth like, but when are they Earth like? So if you were to do this experiment with the Earth, if you were to build this observatory and aim it at the Earth, but you did it three billion years ago, you would get a very different answer for what the Earth was and its ability to harbor life. And if you do it, you know, if you do that experiment now, which is the other reason why you want to do it for as many planets as you can, because you may get a planet in the habitable zone and it could have all the conditions to harbor life, but it might not just because it's at the wrong time in its history. And so when, you know, when you think about the Drake equation and all those things, we're finally getting to the point where, you know, the first couple of terms in the Drake equation, science was able to answer, you know, how many stars are there in the Milky Way yeah. forming per, per year? How many of them have planets? It learned, it turns out that on average, Every star has at least a couple of planets. Now, you know, some stars have more planets than others and, and whatnot. But now we're starting to get into the harder parts of, of the Drake equation. Of those planets, how many are in the habitable zone? Of those planets, you know, how many harbor life? Of those planets, how many have life emerge in a technological enough robustness to communicate? And we're starting to get to the point of being able to, to tackle the term, how many planets may harbor life? We, and And... That's why we need to, to build this observatory and many other telescopes on the ground and in space sort of working in concert to go after this grand question. Well, now, it, in addition to, you know, planets out there that are Earth-like, there was also this L factor in the Drake equation, right, which is the length of time. And, yeah. you know, various people have said that that might be, I, I think Frank had just kind of suggested that might be shorter, right? But that's the length of time for each civilization to exist. Yeah. And so, again, that kind of suggests that for some, perhaps many of these planets, civilizations could have existed. Maybe mm -hmm. they've left relics of some kind out there, right? And I know in recent years, this hunt for techno signatures has mm -hmm. been on in what, as well. Do you think that this is something that these telescopes might be able to spot? Or is, is that going to be too faint and too weak? Well, no, I mean, if you think about, again, if you think about our planet, and and you think about what's in our atmosphere and and uh, things like you know pollution or or yeah. or various other things, those aren't impossible to detect. If you're detecting the atmosphere of the planet and you have a good enough suite of instrumentation, it's in principle possible to to detect techno signatures. That's not the 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 uh, the driving thing that we're trying to do with with habitable worlds. But it's not impossible. And so that makes it very intriguing. Like, you know, since you're already doing the experiment, while you're doing the experiment, you might want to look for, for techno signatures in terms of a, a civilization's imprint on its atmosphere. Some of the other techno signatures are, are much harder to go after with something like habitable worlds, but that's why we build other flavors of telescopes. So, um, I used to like when I when I used to teach the Drake equation back in the day, I fudged the math to always make N, the left hand one, equal to L, the lifetime of the civilization, because, you know, to, roughly speaking, that's about right. And that's always a fascinating thing of how long are civilizations around um, to even be able to be noticed. And, and you know, I, I don't 
I don't claim that habitable worlds will be able to figure that out, but I will also not claim that it's impossible to figure that out with habitable worlds. So it's, it's, it's intriguing. It's fun. Oh, it is. It is. Well, and I think it's something that gets overlooked, right? Because, you know, when people think about SETI, you know, there's this, the Fermi paradox, right? And people are saying, well, why aren't we seeing, you know, why aren't we hearing ET communicate? Why aren't we seeing life, you know, all, all that. But, but then when you get into this larger picture, right? It, it, this, we live in this universe that should be full of life and it's probably out there. And I think we are right on the edge of beginning to truly realize that as a species. And one of my thoughts is that, um, you know, when these telescopes come online and we start to, to basically start to see life on these planets, as I think we may, I, I have a feeling that the general public is just going to be incredibly excited. And I think that may spur the development of future telescopes, right? Oh, so yeah. who knows, you know? Oh, I mean, I, I yearn for the day when, uh, you know, on the cover or I, presumably by that time, you know, you're looking through whatever glasses, you know, of, of every, every news organization in the world is that, is that we've, we've definitively shown the existence of life beyond our solar system. That will be one of the most um, triumphant moments for, for humanity. And as you point out, the, the first thing that's going to happen there is that it's going to inspire us to do more um, and, and to build bigger things and, and to start to contemplate how we as a species might, might live beyond the solar system and things like that. That will, be a, that will definitely be a driving term and, and, and a transformative moment. And, and, you know, much in the same way that, that you know, the, the, the first inklings of, of the space race brought us to where we are today. Now, it, it's done it in fits and starts, and we've slowed down and spun up in various things. But if you think about where we are relative to the Wright brothers compared to the lifetime of, of human species, it's a really, really amazing thing to watch. And, and I think you're absolutely right. If we were to detect... Um, biosignatures uh, for other planets with habitable worlds, one of the first things we would want to do is build an even bigger telescope to understand it better. And, yeah. and, and that's, that's great. That's how we do progress. That's why we're building Hab Worlds is because we built Hubble. And we built Hubble because we built the telescopes that came before it. Well, and so there's progression here also, and I want to get into that briefly. Um, again, it started with Hubble, right? And, uh, you know, when I was a kid, we had these amazing images coming, and they were like, look, this is the Hubble Space Telescope. And just in the last couple of years, I think most folks out there have started to see these comparison images, right, where they would have an image from Hubble, and then they would have an image from James Webb, mm -hmm. and they are just night and day different. I mean, Webb is so much better. But, you know, what's coming after this is something called the Nancy Roman Grace Optical Telescope, which is scheduled to launch in May 2027. Mm -hmm. And that's going to carry, let me see, my notes here say 300 megapixel multiband visible and near IR wide field camera capable of images 100 times better than Hubble produced. So, you know, in addition to that, it's going to have a coronagraphic camera and spectrometer on board, right? So, uh, the Roman satellite is kind of an intermediary, right? So that it comes after Webb and it comes before habitable worlds. And from what I understand, it's going to help set the stage, right, by helping us identify planets that are most likely to harbor life that habitable worlds can focus on. Right. So the, the it, exactly what you said, uh, Roman has two key instruments. The first is this wide field imager. So it takes Hubble quality images, but a hundred times the area of it because Hubble looks at a pretty small spot spot of the sky. If you have a dime and you hold up a dime to the sky, it's the size of Roosevelt's eye. That's how big the the spot spot on the sky both Hubble and Webb look at. Roman will look at a hundred times that. And and critically, Roman will be looking at a lot of stars. And when planets pass in front of those stars, uh, there's a tiny tiny bit of gravitational lensing. This is called microlensing. And so the brightness of the star will change a little bit because of that, that tiny bit of gravitational lensing. So that's one way we're going to find a lot more planets to, to look at. And then the coronagraph that you mentioned on Roman will be really the first good technological demonstrator of the types of coronagraphs that we're going to need to evolve and build for habitable worlds. And it's going to start to look at some of those candidate solar systems. The, the mirror on Roman is too small to actually see Earth's around sun-like stars. You need a bigger mirror for it. 
but it proves the technology and we will look at lots of exoplanet systems in a fundamentally new way and get us marching in in the direction of what systems do we want to look at first with with habitable worlds yeah and again from from the notes that i have uh so habitable worlds should have a four meter diameter mirror in contrast to, oh larger than four mirrors okay yeah and then i'd read 2.4 meters for roman so it's yeah. gonna be a lot larger mirror yeah that's right so and, roman is a 2.4 meter um hubble is a 2.4 meter web is uh, uh, about a six and a half meter. Um, Habitable okay. Worlds is is going to be about the size of Webb or larger. We haven't yet determined how big the primary mirror is going to be. But the way that optics works is that your ability to see detail is a function of not only how big your telescope is, but what wavelength you're using. Since Webb is an infrared telescope and Habitable Worlds is, is an optical UV telescope, even for the same size as Webb, we will see finer detail with habitable worlds because the wavelength is shorter. But habitable worlds will probably end up somewhere between, um, you know, web-sized and one to two meters larger. We don't know yet. That's part of what I'm doing with so many other people, with a couple hundred people now on, on habitable worlds, is figuring out what architectures we need to do the science. But that decision will be made, you know, in a couple of years. Well, and again, the imaging technology is moving forward rapidly as well. And so, you know, just it, it, everything else being constant, my assumption would be that that in itself is just going to produce better and better and better images, right, as the, as the electronics and the sensors get better. Now, have you guys looked at using, like, uh, one of the things that, that I've heard about is in Chile, supposedly, there is an optical telescope being constructed that uses segmented mirrors. That's something that Martin Rees had talked about. Uh, I, I don't know the details about that, but... Well, so the, the, the telescope I'm the chief scientist for, the Keck telescope, is a segmented mirror, te mirror telescope. It's about 10 meters, so it's larger than Webb, has 36 ah, okay. segments in it. So we were the first large segmented mirror telescope in the, in the world. Um, the, the, the one that Martin was probably referring to is the extremely large telescope. It's going to be a 39-meter okay. telescope that will have about 900 segments. So it's significantly larger than, than, than Keck. But segmented mirrors are the way that you build really, really big ones. Um, you know, Keck is too big to be a monolith. It's too big to be a single piece of glass like, yeah. like Hubble or Palomar on the ground is. It's just too big. The largest we can make those mirrors is about eight meters across. To get any bigger than that, on the ground, you need a segmented telescope. For space, in general, to get any larger than about four meters, you need a segmented mirror telescope. And so this is why Webb had to do this huge unfolding process and this complicated series of almost origami-like moves to, to become the telescope that it is now. The thing, One of the things that you mentioned earlier about technology that's advancing rapidly is heavy lift technology. And yeah. the, the larger the rocket we can build, the bigger a facility we can put inside that fairing. And in principle, that means it has to do less complicated things on deployment. And deployment is always one of the risky parts of the mission. And so to the extent where we can reduce that risk or decide to take the same amount of risk and put an even bigger mirror in there. The, you know, the Louvoir mission concept study came up with a 15 meter mirror that you could put in one of those, those, those fairings. Um, we're not going to be building something that large for habitable worlds, but the fact that big rockets exist now that can take more mass farther away means that we can be more ambitious than we were with Webb. At some level, we were limited by the size of the Ariane 5 rocket fairing. That's that set many of the parameters of the telescope, and now we've got bigger rockets. Well, can you use these in an array? This is kind of getting out of my level of knowledge, but yeah, I know radio telescopes, right? Like in the movie Contact with Jodie Foster, you know, people remember her sitting under those big arrays of radio telescopes. I was almost wondering, I mean, since Webb is up there, you know, and Roman presumably will still be up there when uh, HWO launches, you know, is there a way to potentially look at the same star, the same habitable planet or potentially habitable planet with both or perhaps three telescopes at once and get an even higher resolution image? Or is that it, just not feasible? Well, I, I, I can guarantee that multiple telescopes will be looking at the same thing when those launch. 
The difference is that for the radio telescopes, they use each of those radio telescopes to make one giant telescope. They combine yeah. the data in real time to, to, to make those things. Or they do interferometry where they look at small differences because of the astronomical object, the, the baseline that you're, you're looking at, gives very small interferences and they, they use that. There was a mission concept called the Space Interferometry Mission, which did exactly that idea, which is to put multiple telescopes out very far separated and combine their data to make a, a very powerful telescope. Habitable worlds will not be operating that way. It'll be a single, it'll be a single telescope. Um, but again, like we were saying before, if we go out and detect interesting things, we're going to want to build bigger telescopes. And there's only really one way to do that, either or two ways, either interferometry, like we're talking there, or assembling it in space, right? We're going to get to the point where even the biggest rockets that we can think of on the ground will be too small. And we may have to launch components and assemble them in space and build that generation of telescopes, the next next generation, that way. But interferometry is a very interesting idea. It's technologically very difficult once you get to optical wavelengths because the, the information content is varying much faster than in the radio. Mm -hmm. And it's the okay. combinatorial things that you need to do for it is very tough. But it's not impossible. And, and so it's... It's definitely a path forward, I think, for when we're looking at sort of the 2050s and 2060s of what we want to build um, for, for the next generation of looking at exoplanets. Well, John, on that note, let me thank you so much for your time today. It has been truly a pleasure and an honor having you with me and you know, just walking us through what's going on with these observatories is just Again, for me, this is absolutely tremendous. You know, I mean, this it, it is just watching this progression of science, right, from one to the next to the next, and it's it's wonderful. And I think as our understanding of this evolves, the, the public is just going to keep getting more and more excited. Uh, let me close by asking, what's coming up for you in 2024, and how is the program going this year yeah. as well? Um, so it's it's a great question. Uh, 2024 is going to be a really formative year for Habitable Worlds. We we created these these two teams, the START, which is the Science Technology Architecture Review Team. That's the one that I'm the co-chair of. And then the TAG, which is the Technical Analysis Group. We've assembled those teams now. Then we went out into the community and we said, this is an all of community effort to, to bring this observatory to life. And so we're forming working groups of scientists and engineers and, you know, normally, you know, my, my expectations, we might get a couple hundred, we've got nearly a thousand people now involved in that, which is a huge fraction of the astronomical community, relatively speaking. And so this, this year, we're going to be fleshing out all of those science cases that we think will push the observatory in tough technological directions, because you want to identify those first. And that's what's going to be happening over the course of this year. And on the technical side, we're going to be starting to address some of the really tough technological questions. How do you make the mirrors that stable? How do you make the system that stable? How do you make a coronagraph that powerful? And so it's it we're, we're really hitting the ground running on this before the mission becomes a full-fledged project so that when it does, we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from the best information that we have. And that's that's what 2024 is going to be. It's going to be a lot of work, a lot of work. But it's it's going to be very very satisfying work, and and it, it's going to set the stage for, you know, really one of the most powerful uh, pieces of technology human beings have ever made. So it's 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 going to be exciting. Wonderful, thank you again so much for your time today, sir. Happy to do so, Tim, and and I look forward to talking again sometime soon.